Our next presentation will be by Bob Kelly, Wyoming's Bighorn Basin, 14,000 years of climate and human population change. We'll be learning about implications, some very new research at the University of Wyoming in the Anthropology Department has for the Rocky Mountain region. Bob Kelly is a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Wyoming. He is also director of the Frizen Institute. He received his undergraduate training at Cornell University and his doctorate at the University of Michigan. He has been chair of both the University of Wyoming Anthropology Department and the, uh, the head of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Louisville. He also has been president of the Society for American Archaeology, and we look forward to your comments. Thanks. New research, thank you. Well, thank you for having me today. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is some fairly new uh, research that I've been doing with uh, two of my colleagues down at the university, Todd Servo uh, in my department and Brian Schumann uh, in, in ge geology. It's impossible for any uh, scientist to do quality research today all by him or herself. It, it's always uh, joint uh, efforts. Uh, so I wanted to make sure to acknowledge my, my colleagues' uh, contribution to this, to this work here. You know, when, when people uh, come to hear an archaeologist talk, they usually think that they're going to see lots of pictures of um, pretty uh, artifacts, uh, uh, arrowheads and ceramic vessels and things like, like that. But my uh, first mentor uh, in uh, archaeology uh, always told me that uh, it's not what you find, it's what you find out. Uh, the artifacts are what we find, but what we're really interested in is what we find out from those uh, artifacts. So to, today, um, you're, you're not going to see any pictures of uh, pretty artifacts because I'm going to talk about what we've found out and not what we've found. In fact, you saw more pictures of artifacts in Carlos's presentation than, than you'll see here. What I want to talk about is human population and uh, climate. And archaeologists have long suspected that there, there must be some relationship between human population and climate, especially when we're, the populations we're talking about are uh, hunting and gathering peoples. And, and those are indeed the peoples I'll be talking about, because here in Wyoming, the entire prehistory, the last 14,000 years of human occupation of Wyoming up until the time Europeans arrived on the scene um, is all the story of hunting and gathering uh, pe peoples. But we've been, um, we, we, we've had a problem here in trying to assess that hypothesis that there's a relationship between human population and climate because we didn't have good ways, good accurate ways to measure the size of hu human populations in the past and we didn't have really accurate ways to reconstruct climate in a fine-grained uh, fashion. But we can now do both of those, those things. And one of those, the, the, the sort of area that's exclusively archaeology here, is how to reconstruct uh, human populations over, over time. One of the ways that we do it is by looking at the frequency of radiocarbon dates. Some of you are probably familiar with radiocarbon dating. It's, it's the most common method that archaeologists use to date uh, archaeological sites. We now have literally thousands and thousands of radiocarbon dates uh, from archaeological sites uh, across the United States. If we look at the world, we're talking hundreds of thousands, probably. Uh, and, and by the way, we could talk about radiocarbon dating in terms of isotopes. It's all based on everything Carlos just, just, just told you. And if we look at the distribution of radiocarbon dates over, over time, uh, we, we usually see a distribution like, like this. If we go back to 13,000 years ago, which is when people first arrived in uh, Wyoming, you don't find very many uh, dates. And then over time, you get a few more, a few more, and then you get this rapid rise uh, very, very uh, late in, in time. And our assumption here is that the number of dates somehow reflects the number of people. 
You have a few dates, you have a few people. You have more dates, you have more, more people. Most of these dates, why do I say this? Most of these dates are coming from pieces of carbon, pieces of, of charcoal, that we've recovered out of uh, fire hearths, places where people cooked their food and uh, stayed warm uh, at, at night. So those are, those are all things that humans uh, built. Um, so it's evidence of people. Uh, if you have more people, you expect to find more hearths. If you have few people, you expect to find few hearths. So we think it's a good proxy measure of how many people were living on the, the landscape over time. This distribution, which uh, is a compilation of radiocarbon dates from all of Wyoming, uh, done some, some years ago, uh, looks very similar to any compilation of radiocarbon dates from anywhere in the country. They all look about like this. And they really tell sort of one story. People arrive in small numbers, and uh, their population grows over time, grows rapidly, perhaps at an exponential rate, so it's sort of slow in the beginning, and then it gets very, very quickly. We reach a peak about 1,000 years ago, and then there appears to be a rapid decline. Uh, I could talk about that rapid decline later on. What we're really concerned with here is this slow growth and then this rapid growth right towards as we get closer and closer to the, the modern, modern day. That's not an illogical story. When humans entered the New World 13, 14,000 years ago, they, they entered an empty niche. There were no people living, living here. And like most um, creatures that enter uh, an empty niche, their population proliferates. Uh, we could see the same thing happen to rabbits in Australia. Someone, unfortunately, brought a few rabbits to Australia, and within a few years, there's rabbits all over uh, Australia. Same thing happened with nut Nutria, a uh, little rodent-like critter in the southeastern United States. It happened with kudzu in the southeastern United States. Uh, if an if a organism finds an empty niche, they'll populate it fairly rapidly. But there's, there's a problem, an annoying problem with that story that's always bothered us, and we haven't known how, we haven't been able to figure out how to solve it until recently. And let me, let me demonstrate that, that problem by looking at this particular archaeological site. This is the site of Medicine Lodge Creek over at Medicine Lodge State Park near uh, Hyattville. It's on the, the west side of the, the Bighorn Mountains. Uh, if you haven't been there, it's a lovely state park and a wonderful place to go, to go fishing. In this lower part of the the, the picture, there's actually some flat-lying sediments down, down there. And it's a little difficult to see, <laughs> but the, um, the stratigraphy in this site, this wall of dirt, mm -hmm. archaeologists love walls of dirt. Uh, w whenever I pass by a construction zone, I can't, I can't help but stop and look and look at it and look at the wall of dirt, because they always tell a story. And in this particular wall of dirt, we have a lot of flat-lying strata here that were deposited from wind blowing dust into this, uh, up against this cliff, cliff face. But then t two things happened here. The, the creek, that Medicine Lodge Creek, which has got such nice fishing in it, it shifted its course. And it ran over closer to the cliff. And it actually cut away part of that archaeological site and redeposited new dirt there. Then it shifted its location back to the other side of the, of the canyon. At some point later on, it shifted back over to the, closer to the cliff face, and it, it cut out the dirt that it had deposited and deposited new dirt there. What this tells us is that Mother Nature erases archaeological sites off the landscape all the time, uh, either removing them away through erosion or burying them so deeply that it's hard for us to find them. If you want to find a 10,000-year-old site in the north end of Jackson Hole, you have to go down about 150 feet if you want to find that. It's completely buried by, by glacial deposit. Those are hard sites for us to find. So Mother Nature erases sites from the landscape. And the older a site is, the greater the likelihood that it's been erased off the landscape. So we've always had this, 
this, this problem in, in terms of what is it that an archaeologist is sampling when we get these radiocarbon dates from, from an archaeological site. Let, let me describe the problem this, this way. Imagine that you've got a box with a bunch of balls in it. And you want to know, and half of them are white and half of them are red. And you want to know what's the frequency of white and red balls in this, in this box. But you don't have time to count all the balls. So you're going to take a sample. Of course, this is what pollsters do all the time. They can't call up everyone in the country, so they come up with a way to sample the, the population. So if you do everything properly and draw some sample out of this box, your sample should reflect the population that's in the box, uh, about 50-50, white and red balls. But what if, before we get a chance to sample the box, someone comes along and removes part of those half the red balls. If we then sample the, the, the what's in the box, our, if we do everything properly, our sample will reflect what's in the box. It accurately reflects what's in the box when we sampled it. It doesn't accurately reflect what was originally in the box. So now we've got an error. We've got a perfectly accurate sample, but it's not accurate to what the population originally was. This is the problem we have with archaeological sites. The older ones are being removed from the record. They're not there for us to uh, sample. So when we look at this distribution of dates again, we look at those very few dates very early on, very many dates, that are fairly recent, is that because there, were, there are a few dates because there were very few people, or few dates because Mother Nature has erased those old sites from, from the land, landscape. We've known this problem for a long time. We weren't sure how, what, to, what to do about it. But my colleague, uh, down at Laramie Todd Servo is a pretty bright guy. Uh, and he, um, he came up a way, with a way to fix the problem. And it, it began with this piece of information. He looked at the frequency of volcanic eruptions around the world, a, a, a geologic record of the frequency of volcanic eruptions over the last 40,000 years. And that record looks just like this. It has exactly the same shape as our radiocarbon curve. Very few volcanic eruptions 40,000 years ago, they become more and more common and they, they skyrocket. Take it this chart at face value and you should be very, very scared <laughs> because it tells us that there's going to be lots of volcanic eruptions in the near future. And people, you live on the edge of one of the largest calderas in the world. <laughs> we should be worried. But we know the same thing could be happening here. The evidence of older volcanic eruptions could be being erased by Mother Nature over, over time. So we could ask, is there any other record of volcanic eruptions that's not affected by this, this uh, natural process of uh, erosion and, uh, and erasure? And the answer is yes. It comes from the Greenland uh, ice cap. The Greenland ice cap is upwards of two miles thick. It's been deposited there by snow that falls on Greenland. More snow falls, more snow falls. It gets packed down. You pack it enough, it turns into ice. And that record is not being erased. Actually, with, we are losing it over, over time now. But for the time being, it's, it's still there. Once it becomes trapped in the ice, it doesn't go away. And it's a record that's more than 125,000 years long. It's a wonderful record uh, of various sorts of things. And one of them is a record of volcanic eruptions. Because when volcanoes boom, blow up, they throw lots of ash up into the atmosphere. The atmosphere brings, takes it all over the world, and it gradually settles out all over the world, but especially on the, the Greenland uh, ice sheets where it becomes trapped in the ice. 
So those ice sheets provide us with an independent record of volcanic eruptions over time. What does, what does that record say? That record says that over the last 40,000 years, volcanic eruptions have been more or less constant. So we don't have to worry. <laughs> but what it also means is that that record of more or less constant um, uh, eruptions is, th is, is the same record as this one here. They're both recording the same uh, eruptions. And that's kind of interesting because it means that we can mathematically convert the terrestrial record, that, that curve there, which is a, a power function, we can convert it back into what its original record was. We do that with a fairly simple uh, equation <laughs> there. Uh, we're basically reverse engineering the terrestrial record. So we can now take this, this observation and apply it to our record of radiocarbon dates. And uh, in this case, we're just working with the radiocarbon dates from the Bighorn uh, Basin up there in northwestern uh, Wyoming. Radiocarbon dates, we've got a sample of about 600 uh, dates that we've used from a, a, a wide uh, a range of, of sites, both in the basin itself and up in the mountains uh, surrounding the basin as, as well. If we don't if we don't fix this problem with our radiocarbon dates, this is what the curve looks, looks like, S similar to this, to this curve. When we apply this correction factor to that uh, series of radiocarbon dates, it looks more like this. It's a completely different story. We're still covering here from 13,000 years ago up until about the, the present. It doesn't quite go to the, the present day. But instead of just being a record of a steady sort of exponential rise in population, we've now got peaks and valleys. The population has been going up and down over, over time. And in fact, we end up with four uh, major uh, peaks in there. There's some smaller peaks in there, but we're not there, there's always noise in data, and there's especially noise in uh, archaeological uh, data. So we're, we're, the, the small peaks may be significant, but we know that the big peaks are the sig significant ones. So we've got a peak in population 10,700 years ago. There's another one at 9,000 years ago, although there's something kind of curious about that one, which I'll come back to in a minute. There's one about 4,400 years ago and then one about a little more than 1,000 year, years ago. And then we still get that decline at the, at the end there. So now we've got a pretty detailed record of population over time. Now, now if you ask me how many people, 10,700 years ago, how many people were living in the Bighorn Basin, I can't tell you that. I can't tell you the exact number of people. I can't convert this this frequency of radiocarbon dates into numbers of, of people. But we can talk about relative changes over, over time, and that's, that's really a, a, a huge uh, uh, advance. So we've got a detailed record of, of population. Now we simply need a detailed record of, of climate change, and then we can look at the two of them and see if they does, does one, can climate change predict the, the human popu population change? Climate is pretty much made up, is, is, is comprised of two variables. One of these is, is moisture, and one of those is, is temperature. So we'd like to be able to reconstruct those two climate variables over time, independent of one, one another. And, and, and we, can, we can do this now. Um, the moisture data, our record of changes in how wet the environment is, is going to come from a place called Lake of the Woods in the uh, wind, wind Rivers. And our temperature data is going to come from um, a study of pollen from two sites, one in Buck uh, Bean Fen up in uh, 
up in Yellowstone, and the other is a place called Sherd Lake in the Bighorn Mountains. Let me tell you briefly how we get this information. This is, this is my, uh, my colleague Brian Schumann is the one who's contributed this to the, the project, so this is, this is by no means my, my bailiwick, okay? Um, he reconstructs changes in moisture by reconstructing changes in lake levels. And he does this by um, using a, a device known as a ground penetrating radar. It's that red box sitting in that, that uh, a little uh, dinghy that they're dragging behind their, their rowboat here. The, the little yellow dinghy there, they bought at Walmart for $25. The ground penetrating radar sitting in that little dinghy costs $25,000. <laughs> and he simply drags this, uh, this, this ground penetrating radar across the lake in a number of different directions. Uh, it's sending radar pulses down through the water into the underlying sediment. Those bounce back off of uh, buried shorelines, shorelines that are not only beneath the water, but are also beneath silt uh, now. Those shorelines are marked by a slightly higher concentration of, of smaller pebbles and, and cobbles. And so they, they bounce the uh, radar waves of different frequencies back to the, to the, to the surface. So this, this down here is a printout of the, the sort of information he can get. These different lines here are all reflecting different uh, buried uh, shorelines. He then puts a core, puts a coring device down into the edges of the lake, takes that out, recovers pieces of charcoal from various points in the, in the core, and, is, and, and in so doing is able to date the ages of these different buried shore, shorelines. The different shorelines then tell him what the volume of the, of the lake is. And by looking at the, the volume of the lake compared to the size of its watershed area, he can convert that, again, through some mathematical uh, calculations uh, into how much moisture there was in the, in the environment whether it was very arid compared to today or wetter compared to uh, today. So this is where we get our record of change in uh, moisture over, over time. And his record here goes back uh, almost 13,000 years. The temperature record uh, comes from pollen. Um, pollen is a, is a, a, a remarkable thing. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it preserves very, very well. It's hard to destroy pollen. We've recovered pollen from uh, archaeological sites that are thousands of years old. They've actually recovered pollen from sites in Africa that's, that's millions of, of years old. So it's a, it preserves well. The other thing that's interesting about it is that it has different shapes and sizes depending on the plant that produced it. So you can look at pollen under a microscope, because it's really, really small, um, and tell what plant produced the different bits of pollen. You see some examples here. This is about 700 mag magnification pollen of different shapes and sizes. All were produced by different species of plants. So by looking at the pollen, which we recover from cores taken out of, usually out of bogs or out of uh, lake uh, bottoms, we can reconstruct what the plant community looked like in the immediate area and how that plant community changed over time. Now, how we convert that into temperature is pretty complicated because it requires looking at the frequencies of about 60 different kinds of, of pollen. But taking those different frequencies, uh, we can convert that into whether temperature was warmer or cooler than the mean temperature of, of today. Here's one simple example here. If you have a 25% increase in pine pollen relative to spruce, that translates into about a one degree centigrade uh, increase in the mean annual temperature. So once you've compiled your data, if you notice that pine pollen has increased by 25% or more relative to spruce pollen, then you know the environment at that time was a little bit warmer 
than it is today. Now you might say one degree centigrade, who cares if, if the temperature in this room was one degree centigrade warmer or cooler than it is now, probably we wouldn't notice any, any difference. But it has a huge difference in terms of what kinds of plants are present on the, on the, on the lands, landscape. Small changes in temperature are all you need to produce rather dramatic changes in the environment. And that's what really matters. Uh, hunting and gathering peoples are not responding to changes in temperature. They're responding to the changes in the plants that are responding to the changes in temperature and the changes in the animals that are responding to the changes in the plants that are responding to the change in the, in the temperature. So from pollen studies, we're able to reconstruct change in temperature over time. So now we've got two independent measures of climate, moisture and temperature. And we've got our measure of human population from the radiocarbon dates. So what happens? The most significant variable here is probably moisture. And that makes sense given that the Bighorn Basin is a fairly arid environment to begin with. Changes in moisture are things that really have a dramatic effect on changes in uh, plant cover and consequently changes in the abundance of uh, uh, animal life, both of which are crucial to the hunting and gathering peoples. L look at this chart here. Let's see if this works. Um, we start out, in this case, we're about 12,000 years ago. That's how far back our climate record goes. Um, it starts out fairly, a, a fairly dry uh, environment. And this is the tail end of uh, the, the Ice Age. When you, know, you think Ice Age, ice, that, that takes water, right? It must have been wet. Actually, it was kind of dry because all the water is wrapped up in the ice. If the water's all frozen, it's not there for it to fall on the ground. So the environment is fairly dry, cold, but it's fairly dry. At the end of the Pleistocene, when things get warmer, that ice melts, it's released, and so the environment becomes quite a bit wetter. So the way we read this, the yellow line in here is it's drier up here and wetter down, down here. So environment becomes wetter. As environment becomes wetter, our initial human population grows. When it becomes a little bit drier, the population declines. Um, the, population, the, the environment then gets drier, and we see an increase in population, but I'll come back to that in a, in a, in a minute. It seems to be a contradiction, but it's, it's actually not. The environment stays really quite dry for a long period of time. This is sometimes called the altothermal climatic period. It appears across the western United States very, very dry uh, throughout most of the, of the western U U.S. And population goes to about zero in the Bighorn Basin. Between 7,000 and 9,000 years ago, a 2,000 year period, there's basically nobody living in the, in the Bighorn Basin because it's so dry there. Climate starts to get wetter, and as it does, population grows, and it grows quite significantly to this, this peak about 44, 4,500 year, years ago. It then becomes uh, drier, and from population declines. There are some studies which suggest that right around 4,400 years ago, right when this population starts to take a dramatic plunge, that there were significant droughts throughout uh, Wyoming and the Northern Plains. Uh, we're talking a century-long uh, drought. Um, over here, uh, environment gets a little wetter again, and population starts to grow. We get this brief uh, dry interval, and population declines. This interval here is called the medieval warming period, um, because it was first discovered over in Europe, and uh, it happened during uh, medieval times. And that, that shows up across, really across the entire world, that, that uh, slight, the, that short-term arid uh, period. So population pretty much seems to do what we would expect it to do. It gets, environment gets wetter, population grows. It gets drier, population declines. There's nothing really surprising about this, except we can uh, prove the hypothesis and we can see it in a lot more uh, detail. 
This information that we have here, you can't tell from this, this chart, it's in 50-year uh, increments. So we can tie down how population responded to climate change in 50-year uh, increments over, over time. Temperature does something uh, similar, uh, although the relationship isn't quite as, um, as, as neat. It's a little coarser relationship with temperature. We measure temperature here in terms of the difference from the modern mean uh, temperature, which is the temperature from about the year 1900 to 1978. It's just a standard that's taken by, by climate sci scientists. Um, the environment starts out it's fairly cool. It's the end of the uh, Pleistocene, and population grows. We get this long, warm interval here. Again, this is the most warmest time here is, again, that altothermal uh, climatic period when population is extremely low. It's very warm and it's, uh, it's very arid. Put those two variables together and it's probably very, very difficult to live in the, in the Bighorn Basin. Again, we've got this odd little peak here, but I'll come back to that in a second. We get a long-term trend to cooling over, over time, up until about 2,000 uh, 1, year, years ago, and we get population growing here as the environment gets cooler. We have this decline here, which is probably produced by, not by temperature, but simply by a change in uh, moist, moisture. Again, we get a climb towards a warmer environment. That's that medieval uh, climatic anomaly there. Um, a more significant change in temperature than in moisture. And we get a dramatic decline in human population from its peak of about 1,000 years ago. When we put those two variables together, moisture and temperature, and we use a, a statistical technique known as multiple linear re regression, we're able to predict the radiocarbon chart almost perfectly. It's actually, when, when we sat down and actually ran the numbers, I, I said to my colleagues, no, no one's going to believe this because it's too, it's too good. Usually data are pretty sloppy, especially archaeological data. I said, this is, this is too good. No one's going to believe it. We'll find out. We submitted the paper to science a couple of weeks ago, so we'll see if people believe us uh, or not. A couple of interesting things in this, in this chart. Now that, now that we can realistically look at human population change over time and its relationship to climate, we can, we can reconstruct the past in a little more detail. This peak right here that I've mentioned a couple of times, our radiocarbon dates come from two kinds of sites. One of those are sites that we call open sites. They're out in the open. They're along river valleys and out in the basin floor itself. The other set of dates comes from caves and rock shelters. Most of the caves and rock shelters are located up in the mountains. To have a cave or a rock shelter, you need rock. And the rock exp there aren't rock exposures, for the most part, down on the Bighorn Basin floor. They're up in the Bighorn Mountains and the, up in the uh, Absorcas and the Owl, Owl Creeks. And when we look at those two sets of dates, from open sites and from cave sites, this peak is only in cave sites. If we just look at the open air sites from the, the basin floor itself, the, the curve is down here. There's no peak there. So what happened? Well, I suspect what happened is as the environment's getting warmer and drier in the beginning of that altothermal period, people retreat from the valley floor and they move up into the mountains. Consequently, they use caves and rock shelters a little more frequently because there's more people there now than there, there used to be. Eventually, even the mountains become too warm and arid to support that population, and boom, it drops, it, it drops the, the, the curve drops in the mountains as well. This is a very short-lived uh, phenomenon. People are moving off the basin floor, and then they eventually, well, maybe they all just died, or they all moved out of the, of the mountains as, as well. These two peaks are kind of interesting. Um, we don't have much data yet, so this is, this is very, very tentative. 
but we've recently been doing some work on high altitude sites in the Wind Rivers and in the Absorcas. And there are some village sites up there, high in the mountains, at, at like 10 and a half thousand feet. This is a rough place to live. I mean, even in the summer, in July and August, you can get snow up there and severe weather. It's a higher altitude. Uh, it's a hard place to live. It's an extreme environment. And it, it looks like the sites that we're finding seem to date to this time period and this time period. Right when there's a high population density in, in the, the Bighorn Basin at, at both of those, those periods. So it may be that you've got a, a population um, a crunch that's going on. There's more people living down in the valley floors and the competition for resources is getting a little high. So some people move out and move up into these more extreme environments, the kind of secondary places uh, to, to live. That's one poss possibility. And throughout Wyoming, at this last peak, the biggest peak that we have in the entire 13,000 year record, that's when evidence of warfare shows up in the form of human skeletons with evidence of violence to them, projectile points stuck in them, cranial fractures, broken arms from people putting their arms up to ward off blows, uh, as well as some um, fortified uh, butte top locations. Those all appear to date to this second peak here. So this, this, uh, this approach allows us to look at the sorts of population and climate driven factors and how those are affecting other areas of human life. We couldn't do any of this realistically until we had developed this, this new method to reconstruct population from large samples of radiocarbon dates. Finally, there's one last thing we can do. We can look at how does modern climate compare to past our climate. And this is the disturbing part of the, of the, of the story here. The, the, from 1978 up until the, the present, mean annual temperature has increased, and it's increased fairly dramatically. It's about two degrees centigrade warmer than the mean temperature from about 1900 to 1978. We don't have it on here, but that, that means that this yellow line, if we carried it out to today, shoots up like that. If we want to find, if we want to go back in time and find a time when the climate was as warm as it is today, we have to go back to around seven, 8,000 years ago when aridity really reached a peak um, in the Bighorn Basin and probably throughout much of, of, of Wyoming. And at that time, everybody either died or they left. That was their only modes of adapting to that kind of severe climate, climate change. Now, we're not hunter-gatherers. We have different ways of coping with, with problems, but it nonetheless tells us they had to cope with this uh, climate change, and we're going to have to also. Thanks. <laughs> Question? Sir. Yes. <clears throat> Those peaks which you remarked about being high altitude occupation, mm -hmm. would that have been seasonal? And these date you're referring to on this chart right here. But most of those populations have been somewhat migratory, moving with the temperature of the, weather, the seasons. Uh, the, the occupations at high altitudes at 10,500 feet would absolutely have to be seasonal. You can't spend the winter uh, up there. Uh, I mean, you're talking about snows that are you know, enormously deep. So they're probably up there in the, in the, only in the, in the summers. Um, these are, these are uh, hunting and gathering people, so you're correct, they are nomadic, they are moving with the, the seasons, but these sets of radiocarbon dates don't, they're at too coarse a scale for us to talk about, about them reflecting those seasonal movements. These are really just reflecting the gross numbers of people on the landscape. 
they're, they're moving around on the landscape. So at different times of the year, you would have more people down on the valley floor than you had up in the mountains, and then at other times it might be reversed. Um, but but that, that, that chart is not really, I don't believe is really affected by that, by that fact. Did you have anything to do, <coughs> excuse me, with the excavations going on here in Jackson in the south end of the valley just before the South Park Bridge? Edge over there at uh, Game, Game Creek. Yeah, what was going on there? What did they find? Uh, well, they're, they're finding evidence of human use of that uh, locality going back. I think their earliest dates were about 9,000. Uh, year, years ago. What did they, why did they have to dig right there? Was something found that said, oh, this might be a place where we should start to dig? The particular reason that they're, that they're digging there, um, th there's really two reasons. One is, I believe they're widening the road there. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there are, there, are, um, uh, uh, there, uh, there are laws in place which say that if you're going to do um, road building, pipeline construction, and so on, that you have to file an environmental impact statement, and part of that is the impact on the, the archaeological res resources. So um, the, that's being done by the state uh, archaeologist's office. They do a survey along the right of way, uh, surveying the land that's going to be affected by the road widening uh, work. Uh, they probably put uh, test units in. Uh, they, they systematically test all the land in the, in the right of way. They probably ran into some archaeological remains, uh, did a little bit of work, established that it was an important, significant site. So they're doing the excavation now so that by the time the bulldozers arrive, the site will have been um, removed professionally rather than removed by, by bull what bulldozers. They find in there? Do you know so far? Uh, the, the, they're, they're still doing the excavation. They'll be working there again next, next year. So uh, th there's been no report done on the site yet. So I can't tell you exactly. I, I know what they've kind of told me in conversations uh, in the hallway. Um, they're finding th th their usual things we find in archaeological sites, stone tools, um, animal bone, uh, hearths, um, evidence of various human activities going back to about 9,000 years ago. So, so the nice thing about that site is it's a, it's a continuous record in one place of uh, human, human occupation. So that's not a really good answer to your question. It, it, the answer is we have to wait until they, they do all the analysis. Because the, it's, they found stuff, now they have to find out what they've found out from that, from that stuff. Joe. Yes, uh, I'm interested in the power data and how you can be sure of it reflecting actual temperature changes when it could also perhaps reflect some disease among the plants that's not related to temperature change. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd have to have a, a palynologist here to really answer that, that question well. They're able to link um, the changes in plant frequencies by, by doing modern studies. So they do things like set out collectors in different environments that collect pollen. And then they then take that back to the, to the lab and count the pollen up, count up the different frequencies of, of pollen. And then they go and do a vegetation survey in the area so they can see how plant frequencies relate to frequencies of, of pollen. And the reason they have to do that is because some plants produce more pollen than other plants. Uh, some plants pollen is carried long distances. Other pollen is very heavy and it, it falls very close to the uh, plants. So the, so the relationship between the frequency of pollen and frequency of plants is not one to one. But by studying lots of different modern vegetation communities, we can, we can figure out how to calculate percentage of plants from percentage of, of pollen. So, so that's, that's where the method comes from, is by studying modern pollen rain and modern veg, veg, vegetation. But, and, but it seems to assume that any changes in the ratio of pollen is caused by temperature, or it could be caused by other things. It, it, it could be at the scale that we're looking at the data here, it's probably mostly temperature uh, related. Um, it, it, you could get diseases that come in. Um, the, 
the pine, pine beetle clearly is going to reduce the production of pine pollen in the Rocky Mountain forests. Um, but in terms of the, the temporal scale that we're looking at here, that's probably a little blip in the data and is not important to long-term secular changes over, over, over time. That's, that's why we only look at kind of the major changes and not the little, little blips in the line. Is there any uh, indication in, in any of this that the activity of man uh, has contributed to anything to do with uh, temperature change during this whole period? Uh, no, they, they, would, they wouldn't have contributed to temperature change. There's nothing that hunting and gathering peoples could have done to, to have altered uh, temp, temp, temperature. However, they could alter the vege vegetation. Most hunting and gathering peoples burn their environments. Um, I did research for uh, three years with a group of people called the Mikea, who live in southwestern Mad Madagascar, that island off the, co the southeast coast of uh, Africa. And I'd go out foraging with them, and guys would just stop. And, and they'd kind of look back, and they'd, they, they all carried little big lighters. And they would just kind of poof, light the grass, the dry grass on fire, and then we'd go on walking. And the place is just this conflagration behind me. It's terrifying. I mean, I've never been in a forest fire except, except there. And I'd say, why did, why did you guys do that? Why should you burn the whole place down? And they'd say, oh, when we come back, it'll be easier to walk through there. I have a question on the temperature. It seems that you're doing a comparison to a datum, a mean. What would happen if you changed or used a different datum to compare the data? Would your results be the same or different? Um, the, there's a reason that climate scientists look at it relative to a standard. Do you, do you know what it, what it is? You're a real scientist, not me. I'm an archaeologist. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm just curious because the temperature globally over time, I mean, if you go back to the time of dinosaurs, we were a lot warmer then. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a narrow window now where you're talking about humans. You know, how you change or what you're doing your comparison again seems like it would have an implication. Uh, it, it's, you could, we have to have some standard against which to, against which to measure. Every, everything. So the, the standard that they've chosen to use is this long-term mean from about the year 1900 to 1978. But a lot of things happened between 1900 and 1978. I, I think it's because the, the, right, and because there's been a major change after 1978, I think is why we sort of draw the line at, at 1978. But it's, it's just a, a standard that we look you know, the standard for, for, for carbon isotopes is the peridolonite from South Carolina. Because that's, that's why, because it was a rock sitting in the guy's office who, who invented the method, right? And he, he needed a, a standard, and so he used that. Yes, it is gone now, yeah. They used it all. This says temperature departure from the norm. Now, these are relevant temperatures. Okay. But they're, so now, and the fact that was the warmest time, this is well known um, from many different sources of data over this range. If you start going back over millions of years, the age of dinosaurs and so on, there are other sources of data that suggest what the relevant temperatures were. But certainly for the last 12,000 years, we know it warmed significantly. Mm -hmm. Coming out of the ice age, it peaked at about 8,000 years, it came down again for the little ice age, and that's been peaking in the last 50 years. You're right. The, that's not, Little Ice Age is not, doesn't really get reflected in these diagrams because the data don't quite go up to them. But that was actually a, a return to colder conditions from about AD 1500 into the about AD 1850, a little bit later. Um, you, you know, old folks here in Wyoming who are, who are long, who are like third generation, talk about how bad the winters were back in granddaddy's day uh, in the later 19th century. They're, they're right. That was the tail end of the Little Ice Age and the winters were a lot worse. <laughs>
Your opening slide had a cave of some type on it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Why that's you a, that one? That's a, I picked that one just because it's a nice picture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the site of, um, and because everyone expects you can go to an archaeologist's talk, you're going to see archaeological sites, so there, there it is. Okay. Uh, that's the site of Mummy Cave, which is on the north fork of the Shoshone River as you drive out of Cody. If you go to Walmart in Cody, it's 33 miles from the Walmart in Cody up to South, south Fork. Um, the road used to go right in front of it, and when they redid the road and built the bridge there, it, 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 it no longer goes right in front of that site. That site was excavated in the 1960s. It was an important site um, to the archaeology of this region because it's 40 feet deep. And so it has this long sequence in it that goes back. The earliest date there is about 9,000 years. Uh, I went back there a couple of years ago to determine if that was correct, if that was the earliest evidence of human use of that site. And our work suggests, yeah, that. that that we could we could confirm that that is the earliest evidence. Given the uh, peak in uh, temperature that we had in the ago and the probable other peaks for millions of years prior to that, does that in any way influence your thinking about what humans may be contributing to the current increase in temperature? Where's the fellow I was just talking to about this? Um, we don't. We don't honestly know. We, we know that climate's gotten warmer. That's, that's kind of an undeniable fact. Uh, how much have humans contributed to it? OK, this is, you know, I'm walking on thin ice here uh, because people have opinions on this and some people have strong opinions on it. And I'm not a climate, I'm an archaeologist. <coughs> I, I deal with dead people. I, I, <laughs> so I, I, tend, I tend, you know, I like dead people. They don't argue with me. Uh, the, uh, uh, we, it's, it's almost, humans have almost certainly played a role in the current warming. How much of a role? I, I, I'm not certain from the evidence that I, that I've read. They, are they responsible for 10%, 50%, 100%? 100%? Um, I'm really, I'm really not, not certain. We can certainly see that Mother Nature can produce uh, a, a level of uh, aridity that we're experiencing now, because humans did not do that 8,000 years, years ago. It could be all natural. Uh, it, it's, but it's probably not. There's, there's probably a certain level of, of human involvement uh, in it. Going back, well, probably beginning actually a couple thousand years ago. Uh, I'm interested in your uh, comment evidence of human habitation one type or another somewhere around 12,000 years ago mm -hmm. in that general area in there. And I'm curious about, there's evidence, new evidence that's been up just fairly within the last year or so of migration from Asia there into South America went uh, almost 16,000 years ago. Close. And yeah. it predates, or predates the folks culture, so to speak. And do you think that is connected to people there were connected with long-term migration that came through that area? Uh, the, 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 question, uh, the, the question you're asking is, you know, when did people first arrive in the, in the New World? And it, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer because the further we go back in time, the, 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 the less and less evidence we have of human occupation because of this, this process of site removal over, over time. We can definitely say all archaeologists will agree that people were here by about um, at least 13 and a half thousand years ago. That, that's clear, we all agree on that. Were they here earlier than, than that? Um, there's a couple of sites that have been found. There's one in Oregon that's uh, uh, probably about 14 and a half thousand years ago. And that's, that's based on the presence of I'm sorry, the data are what they are. It's based on the presence of human poop that they found in a dry, a dry cave, which gene the genetic information from that poop says it's, it's human. It's kind of odd, the earliest artifact we had. <laughs> but you know, that's, the, the data are what they are. We can't, we can't pick and pick and pick and pick. Uh, 
uh, but and, and, and there are some archaeologists who argue people were here much earlier, 50,000 years ago. I think that's complete not nonsense. I think the earliest evidence is probably about 15, maybe 16,000, uh, but but no earlier than that. Here in Wyoming, we don't have good evidence of anyone being here until about 13 and a half thousand years ago. That's, that's the earliest evidence, direct evidence that, that, that we have. I'm not sure that answered your, your question. No, yeah. so. I have a feeling that nature is preparing or adapting to us. It just seems to me that you know it's got consciousness, the birds and other wildlife. Oh no, here comes humans, you know. And I'm wondering if they don't or you know, have some idea that we could be an aid or we could be a problem and it it shifts according to us being here in droves or or isolated little villages or something. And if there isn't some kind of continuity of um, you know, kind of coming and going in that regard. Are you have a comment? You know, I, I'll stand before you here today as, as a scientist. So like, like Carlos, I'll say, here, here's where the data leads, leads me. Um, I don't know of any data that leads me to the conclusion that nature has a consciousness and is responding to us. Nature does respond to the inputs to the system. And if the input to the system is, okay, uh, uh, greenhouse gases, which makes the globe warmer, then the environment is going to respond to that. And it does it by shifting precipitation patterns, uh, which uh, has an effect on the, the, the plant life, the, the distribution of plant life around the world, which has an effect on the distribution of animal life. So it, it responds, but it's, it's a systemic response. It's not, a, it, I believe it's a conscious response. Uh, In some, in some ways, it might, it might seem like it. Um, you mess around with Mother Nature, and she's going she's gonna to slam you, just like your mom does. You know, you do something wrong, and your mom gets mad at, at you. Um, uh, but, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think that's the case here. There is, there is a, a response, but it's, it's not a conscious response. When you look at uh, current moisture levels, do you know what historic period they relate to as even any temperature, I mean any temperature level? When I look at the moisture level. I don't know the answer to that one. I I I'll, I got my cell phone. I'll be Brian Sheen and call and see see if we can answer. One more question, Bob. Okay. Temperature between seven and eight thousand take into consideration the volcanic activity. Do volcanologists weigh in on how that might have impacted the warming or cooling of your, your chart up there, or the impact of meteor strikes, or you know those kinds of events? Because which, when volcanoes explode, if they're big enough, um, they put lots of ash in the atmosphere, and those generally cool. The environment down. Um, the best known example of this is uh, Krakatoa crack, crack, went off in 1893 or something? I can't remember. 1838. 1838? Oh, yeah. thank you. Um, and they called that the, the, the year without summer, and it, it, it affected Europe. But you know, Krakatoa is down there in, in, the, in the Indonesian archipelago. So, but um, its effect is really one or two years. It's fairly short lived. So again, that maybe that'll show up as a little a little blip in the in the data, but it's not playing a role in the long term secular uh, uh, trend. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Bob.